is everybody doing today? Welcome to another episode of Inside Inside Sales. Do I do I sound like I'm in a good mood? I am. I am in a good mood. It's weird. Uh, why am I in a good mood? I honestly don't know why. I, you know, I think what it was. So we here at Vanilla Soft a couple of weeks ago, our CEO. Uh, he, he kind of, you know, took the pulse of the company, talked to everybody, which is what you should do. Right. I know we as sales reps often feel like we're alone. I, I don't know. Maybe you don't. I often do. It's like, I, we're front facing, we're, we're out there, like we're in the, 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 the heat of battle, you know, we're the ones rushing the opposite line, trying to, trying to, you know, get that revenue, that next deal. Everybody sits cozy and comfortable back in their offices, you know, and they're doing a little coding. They're doing a little, you know, documentation writing, and it's kind of comfortable. And we're out there getting rejected and hammered. That's what we think. That's what we feel. And what you feel is right, by the way, just so we're clear, your feelings are real. Um, I feel like Dr. Fraser Crane. I'm listening. But uh, with that all said, he made a declaration. He said... On um, this date, on I think it was a Friday, the April 30th, we're having a COVID holiday. The whole company is off. And uh, you paid everything. You just it, It's off. And go have a long weekend and just, you know, recover from COVID. And uh, it was crazy because I've had long weekends before. Lots and lots and lots and lots of times. You may have noticed I have white hair. I've had many long weekends. Uh, yet I woke up Friday morning and, and I woke up and I'm like, I don't have to go in to work today. And it was like this weight, this burden lifted off of me. And ever since then, I've been feeling really good. I even called him up the other day and I said, it sounds stupid, but that one ass day that you gave us just really changed my whole psyche. It's amazing how when you change, when you change stuff up, it can totally have a dramatic impact on your outlook and on your outcomes. I remember back when I was uh, in school and I'd met my wife, in fact, true story here. And I've talked a bit about my wife before. Um, I may even talk about when we were dating. Um, I don't remember <laughs> meeting her. Isn't that brutal? I do not remember meeting my wife. And, uh, but she tells the story and in my mind, I've got it all mapped out. And, I, and it's totally something I would do. Um, and what it was, was I was running for student union president and I, it was the first day of canvassing and I'd put all these posters and stickers everywhere because this is pre-internet day kids. All right. So everything was done hard copy and I put all these stickers and all these tables and we were sitting down, my campaign manager and I were sitting down in the, what we used to, you know, colloquially call the meat market, which is where you would sit in the, in the outdoor patios and stuff and look at everybody else walk by bit of a meat market. You get the idea. And, uh, and I had stickers on all these tables. And anyway, I'm at one table and an adjacent table beside me is a whole bunch of people of which one of those people was a classmate of mine in one of my classes. And this attractive young woman walks up, happens to know him and a few of the people at the table stops and shoots the breeze with them, sees my sticker on the table, has nervous energy. She was really, really always to this day, nervous energy. And she starts peeling it away. And so my colleague waits and my classmate waits until she's done. And then she turns to, he turns to me, says, Daryl, look what she's done to your campaign. And I'm like, what the hell? I'm trying to get elected here. Like, you have to vote for me now. And she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And she was embarrassed. And I, I gave her another sticker to put on her, her, her clothing that she had to wear to promote me around campus. And she promised me she would uh, cut into the end. She never voted at all. She didn't even vote for me. So, and, and you want to complete that story. I actually won. Um, you talk about, you know, Florida elections. I won by seven votes and I'm not making that up. And that was what the recount. So despite her, I won. And eventually I kind of became aware of her because remarkably she kept on appearing in front of me. So what did I learn in this whole process of wooing and courting her was that I was somewhat getting my messaging backwards. I was trying to convince her that I was a nice guy. I was a great guy. This guy that she would want to date. Problem was, she was already dating somebody. And it wasn't until I kind of took a different tack of pointing out, you know, how, how would I phrase this? Opportunistically, 
some of the shortcomings of the dude that she was dating, that she started to realize that maybe now was a good time to consider her options and make a change, especially when this awesome piece of meat was dangling in front of her. How's that for color? Um, so I had to totally change my tack to woo this fine woman. But of course, I was stupid for the first you know, several days, weeks prior to that, having not much luck. I'm slow, kids, and you haven't figured that out yet. See, that's the thing. Often in sales, it's how we approach our prospect that's causing us to not succeed, not unlike me. So what's the problem? The problem is it's your messaging. It's the, it's like me when I was talking to, I was trying to court my wife. It was my messaging. It was how it resonated with her, how I approached it. It was, everything was messed up. So then I said, who, who my friend should I talk to, to talk about this very situation that I see every single day. And that, that is Jim Carr. He is the author of the science of customer connections. He is a consultant and professional speakers with Carr and Associate. He is the king of messaging. He is the host of Manager Message Podcast. And most relevant, most relevant in the near term is you can watch him at the Outbound Conference when he talks about putting together a sales messaging playbook. And I'm just going to say dot, dot, dot that rocks, kicks ass, and achieves the results you want. Now, he doesn't say that in his marketing. He's a little more subtle. He's probably Canadian. So there we go. Jim, how are you doing, my friend? I am doing well, Daryl, and I'm just processing your, uh, your sales campaign with your uh, soon-to-be bride yes. back in the day and thinking, well, you did at least a couple of things really well. First of all, you were trying to establish competitive differentiation right away. I said, that was good. But you managed to build awareness early by affixing your name onto your prospect's clothing, if I get the story right. So you are correct. I don't, I don't know if that's something that most of your listeners and viewers are able to do, especially in a more virtual world these days. But that's a that's a pretty good tactic. Well, it's funny you bring that up, because in many regards, they are. Think about it, whether it's uh, applications, I'm thinking like, um, Sendoso or Alice or PDF or whatever it's PDF. I think it's PDF. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch out there where I can actually send a tchotchke, right, to my prospects or my customers. And, of course, what is that tchotchke? It could be a, a piece of apparel, a hat, a coffee mug, whatever. And it's always branded. So, in fact, the modern-day version of using tchotchkes and giveaways to actually have your prospects and customers promote your brand is, I mean, I was, I was a trendsetter. I was a trendsetter, Jim. That's what we're getting out of You this. were, yeah, you had something that was even better than Vote for Pedro from Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you cannot dismiss Vote for Pedro. That is epic. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, you're talking at Outbound. For those who don't no, Jim, he is crazy good. So go to Jim Carr, and I'm going to, it's not, it's J-I-M, all right? It's pretty straightforward. Carr, K-A-R-R-H.com. Feel free to multitask. Down on my guy. Please go follow him on LinkedIn. You won't regret it, because he's just this wealth, this fountain of nonstop messaging content. In fact, uh, Jim, I was recently hanging out with Jim and Daryl Amy on this killer event that they did online virtual. It was all week about getting sales and marketing alignment. And again, even yes. on that, it's all about mar uh, messaging. And, and for those who are wondering, uh, if you know Daryl, Amy, and you know Jim, we can all agree, right? Jim is just way better than Amy, just so we're clear on that. Now. Yes. And we'll say that because I know Daryl will be listening uh, or viewing at some point here. And, and we'll just state that for the record. Yeah, it's public record. Now, you and I were talking uh, <laughs> before the show about, you know, what do, what do we want to cover? Right. And we were brainstorming back and forth. And, and this is, I'm going to, I'm going to put down, this is the, the exchange folks that Jim and I had I'm gonna, one thing, he goes, we could always talk about how to align sales messaging with customers decision-making and where sales teams tend to get it backwards. And when I read that, boom, I got it. But then, then the second part of me was like, oh yes, sales teams do get this backwards. Hence my story. But Jim, can you set the stage? Because I we've never covered this topic, 
And I, there's all this, I've had this conversation with so many reps where they think their messaging and their approach is fire. They just think they've got it. They're rock stars and they don't want to hear how they're getting it backwards. So let's, let's kind of pull the, ba- the, the bandaid off. Let's kind of, you know, look at the wound. Tell us what you mean by that. And there's some possibility, Daryl, that that person that says ours is perfect, perhaps they're right. But that would be counter to my typical experience. And you know, I find what even, and in fact, especially experienced, knowledgeable, passionate reps who are so anxious to share their message and talk about their stuff, they are uh, oftentimes the most chronic get it backwards E folks. So, uh, and we have to push against our industry. We have to push against our very brains and the like. But let me tell you that the, the overall pattern and then we can break it down a bit. And if you can get this pattern right, you'll be much more than just 1% better. Uh, You'll be a lot better. So when when I think about messaging at the level, I'm thinking about actual selling conversations, not your mission statement or vision statement or tagline or whatever. It's what you actually say and show and do and ask and answer in customer or prospect conversations. So what we want to do is make sure that our messaging is relevant and it's clear and it's on point whatever the stage of decision-making for that customer or prospect is. Here's the, the, the main thing to keep in mind for what your message should be. Most prospects, most customers who are thinking about maybe even doing more business with you, they have to answer some questions for themselves. And they're either consciously aware of it or they're not consciously aware of it. But I can tell you as a PhD, Daryl, and psychologist and former CMO, as well as a consultant, they do it. There are three steps that they go through. And in this sequence, the first thing that they have to answer for themselves is, why should I change what I'm doing today? Or at least consider change. As much as we all talk about change, this, that, and the other, no one wants to change. It's risky, it's uncertain, it's uncomfortable. And so there's some status quo that that prospect has, and, and they have to think through, is it, is it worth it? Is it worth the pain and the uncertainty to even consider a change? The second thing that they would do is say, okay, if it's worth considering change, why now? What's the sense of urgency? There are 25 great ideas. We have 10 different corporate initiatives. We have all sorts of things that are worth considering doing, but we can only concentrate or get budget for three or four or five things at a time. Why should your idea, your solution come to the top of that list? And then finally, they would say, okay, if it's worth considering change and if this is urgent, if this is a priority, hey, Daryl, why you? Why Vanilla Soft? Why whomever? versus either a named competitor, do it myself, whatever their options are for that choice. So why change? Why now? Why you? That's the process that prospects go through. Here's where the disconnect happens. A lot of sales professionals and selling organizations try to go in reverse because they're so passionate, because they're so knowledgeable about the why me part about their stuff and their value prop and their passion and all the information and run the demo, all of those sorts of things, they try to start with, why me? And that tends to be um, unfulfilling, unprofitable, unsuccessful. They're trying to establish that differentiation before they've made the case for change. And so, okay, that doesn't work. So let me back up and I'll try to promote a sense of urgency. And oftentimes that's rather artificial and contrived too. Oh, let's rebundle it. Let's cut the price. Let's run an end of quarter promotion. Uh, (laughs) Whatever it is, let's double down on it. And that tends to either not work or maybe you attract a new customer at a discount price and it's not even the right kind of customer. It doesn't really match your, your ideal customer profile. And then, and only then they'll go back to what should have been step one is making the case for change. And, and then they'll go through all these things. Well, we have to educate the market, blah, 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 and start over again. That's just trying to go uphill through the rear view mirror. It, it doesn't work uh, for the most part. So if you can think about your messaging in terms of how you actually lead and serve through those individual selling conversations at different points along the way. So there's, there's messaging that you would tailor to the why change piece, which you have to get right at the beginning. And then there's messaging that could work in the the why now, promoting a sense of urgency, and then 
then you can address the, the why us, the differentiation piece and getting past some of the uh, specific objections that a prospect might have. So if you can just flip that or that sequence, then you'll be ahead of the game. So let's, let's have some fun with this. <clears throat> you tell me if I am guilty, <laughs> by the way, the answer is I'm guilty um, of- uh, um, Daryl, don't worry about it. I've been guilty of this myself. Oh yeah. Okay. So here we go. Uh, I'm going to cold call Jim and Jim, you don't even have to answer. I'm going to do all the talking. <laughs> Mistake 101. Are um, you leaving a voicemail or am I going to answer here? No, you're going to be listening. You're going to answer as if you said hello okay. and, uh, and tell me, I'm really doing this to dramatize what so many reps do, but I'll be a, I'll be a rep for vanilla soft for the moment. So ring, ring, Jim answers. Okay. And I say, Hey Jim, uh, it's Daryl Prail here with VanillaSoft. VanillaSoft is the industry's most established, uh, impactful sales engagement platform that can often triple your pipeline, increase your speed to lead, and dramatically affect your persistency in the pursuit of new business. Now, most people I talk to have a real issue hitting their numbers. Their pipeline is not sufficient. And they look at the only way to fix this is more with more um, either more reps or more marketing spend uh, and, and, and they don't have the resources to do that. And then they're stuck with a poor, you know, MQL to SQL conversion rate. And then they're wondering why they're not hitting their numbers. I'm assuming this is you, right, Jim? And I'm going to stop there. Anybody relate um, to something like that? Uh, you, you started to lose me about six words after vanilla soft. Exactly. I was trying to figure out, do I know Daryl Prail? Well, in real life, I would be very impressed that Daryl Prail called me, but <laughs> it, for purposes of, of, uh, of this, this exercise, um, I'm at that moment trying to process this person's name, uh, the company and all that. And I'm not really paying attention to what you do. And at the very end, um, and this is more of a, a, a small peeve, kind of a personal thing, but I find that in practice, this people get ahead of themselves. They say, does this describe you? Or we think it, we work with people exactly like you. And my initial reaction, most human beings have a, a reaction of like, a visceral no one is reaction. exactly like me. Right. Yeah, you don't now, even know me. I, I might be interested if you say as someone who runs a professional services firm or someone who has a particular role or something that you're seeing in a particular industry that there are patterns. If you're really an expert, if you really know something about my kind of work or my situation, you can go in with a really good working hypothesis of the kinds of things that I might be challenged with and patterns that I'm seeing. And frankly, if you're a rep and you talk to a lot of people who are at least somewhat like me, and we've used the quotes like me, so by role, by persona, by business challenges, whatever that might be, it, it is slightly intriguing because you do talk to a lot of my peers or near peers. And that is an intriguing thing. A lot of us want to know uh, with, through social comparison, kind of how do we, how do we stack up? What are you seeing from people that you think are like me? And then we can have a, a good conversation, but, but no, um, leading with the value prop, dumping too much information without coming up for air and telling, uh, someone who's a prospect that I know exactly what you need right now are all prompting me to either tune you out or to actively be mad at you because you don't understand me. You haven't earned that right to make that assumption, Daryl. Yet, many people listening are like, I don't get what Daryl did right. He actually introduced himself. He So he talked about himself. So the, uh, the listener had context. And this is what people are probably going to say to you. Then he created um, a sense of urgency around, around common issues people have. And then he did some education around a benefit statement. You can, uh, you, you can do this. Um, and this is something you suffer with. So now it's, you know, you're able to go and, and start the actual process qualification. Now I've hooked them. And, and I've heard you say this before. Yeah. That's comfortable for me to lead that way. What I just did in my dramatization, because I'm really comfortable as a sales rep talking about me or what I hawk or who I work for. I know that topic inside and out. And I, and if I talk long enough, something I say may hopefully convince you may resonate with you and convince you to not hang up or yell at me or reject me. 
And you may say, well, tell me more about this element where you say you can, you know, increase the conversion from MQL to SQL or speed to lead or persistency. So all of this is, is literally, if I'm right, everything you say we sales reps do, and I probably did that completely backwards because I heard you say it was, you said, why change? Why now? And why you? Those are the three things. So assuming that you're right and assuming that I totally botched that, in that scenario, how, following your approach, should I have approached that cold call? I can't tell you the exact specifics because, as they say, um, a, a prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. But I can say from what you went through and what you just talked about, that there are a few things that as guidelines, um, understanding buyer psychology and understanding brain science that I think might, might help your listeners and viewers a lot. Um, so one of the things that you just know, uh, noted, and, and if I skip past anything, pull me back, Daryl. But one of the things you were saying was if I talk long enough, right, then, then at some point there's going to be some hot button topic. There's going to be some word that might resonate. Okay, that's not characteristic of a good conversation. One thing that we know from research, from business conversations, and this is all the way from selling conversations to job interviews, is that people view it as a healthier conversation if it's roughly 50-50 in terms of who's talking and who's listening. And it's also the case that people in general say that someone is a brilliant conversationalist if they listen to me. So if, if we find it in a, in a conversation, if I'm the one doing, wound up doing most of the talking and they ask me later, how's Daryl as a, as a communicator? Oh, he's terrific. He's wonderful. Uh, he was just, he was listening. So, so the fact of volume of words and dominance of the conversation is, is not your goal, right? So what you're really trying to do is elicit some feedback and, and do some good uh, early stage discovery and position yourself as, as someone who might be able to solve those problems, but you got to use the, the language of your prospect more so than the language of what you know. Uh, to make another uh, movie reference, Daryl and everyone, if you remember the movie Goodwill Hunting, there was a uh, uh, the the Matt Damon character, and there was the Robin Williams character was his therapist, and they were unpacking all sorts of psychological trauma that he had had, and he, he was repeating in the session, "It's not your fault." It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And to some degree, if we fall into these patterns, Daryl, it's not quite our fault. Uh, there are a couple of things that drag us down out of what's really good messaging behavior. The first is our brains. Our brains are wonderful creations. We're only beginning to scratch the surface of understanding them. But one thing we do know is our brains are wired for comfort and pleasure. And, and doing some background uh, research for my book that you mentioned, uh, I discovered that the parts of our brains that get activated when we talk about ourselves are the same parts of our brains that get activated when we have a great meal or take psychedelic drugs or think about sex. It's, it, it makes us happy. We get a little chemical shot when we talk about ourselves, our passion, our product, our history, our backstory, whatever it is. So that's, that's our default. We have to, as individuals and as teams, then we have to plan against that. We have to get against that drag. The other thing that we have to guard against is our industry and just past habits, which tend to be too techy, oftentimes too many acronyms, too much insider language, not the language of our buyer or our prospect. And so, again, there's a discipline around messaging of, of not only connecting of where that prospect is in their decision-making process, but also letting them talk, prompting them, finding out what is unique about their situation and using language that isn't ours and not trying to dominate that conversation. I know a lot of, a lot of things that are, that are in here, but if you just think about what would make a good professional conversation and then start reverse engineering that process. So we've just scratched the surface here, folks. Obviously there's a lot there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff here, right? So a couple takeaways, you know, me, I'm all about, you know, learning is earning. I cannot say it enough. You get tired of hearing it. Truly go to Amazon. I'm, I'm going to say Amazon. Maybe your bookstore has it. Check out, um, the book, 
the science of customer connections. Second thing I would do, because this is what we're talking about, right? How to connect. That's literally what the messaging is all about. Second thing, go to your podcast player and do the search for manage your message podcasts. Because these are skills that just don't help you in sales. These are skills that help you in life, career, relationships, everything else. These are inherent skills that you need to develop on your own, constantly develop. There's no, this is a good thing. This is a competitive edge, competitive advantage. So check the message, manage your message podcast. Now, I do want to talk though and say there's, there's a third option here for you. you. You can do option A and option B, that's fine. But option C is something I really want you to to consider. And that, that is invest in yourself, invest in Jim Carr by signing up for the Outbound Conference. So the Outbound Conference, if you're not aware, it's taking place. There's two ways you can do this. Online, of course, or in person. Whoa, remember those days? Online, it's June 13th to 18th. So you got about a month or so before it kicks in. But in person, June 15th to 18th at the Georgia World Congress Center in Atlanta. I'm going to be there. That's the plan. I have been inoculated. I have been vaccinated. So, uh, and I'm coming from Canada, so I have to cross a border and everything. It's a big deal for me to cross that border. And, and it's even a bigger deal to come back across that border, but that's another story. But why am I doing that? Because this is the conference to be at where people like Jim and so many other experts, sales experts are at. Now, Jim, talk to me about your track, what you'll be talking about. Well, what I am going to be talking about, the title is What Works for Your Sales Messaging Playbook. Now, the a playbook is simply an approach. I, what I find is that both for individual reps and if you're looking across a team, so if you have BDRs, SDRs, reps, uh, other people that are all trying to get something that's consistent and effective working together, that you need some single source of conversational truth. In the absence of that, in something that's actually planned and documented in bringing people together, well, what happens? Well, everyone kind of does their own thing. It's very tribal. People fall back into their familiar patterns, the way that I tell a story, the questions that I ask, the stories that I share, and uh, that doesn't tend to work very well. So we get all this, the disconnect, there's the sales marketing disconnect, of course, but we have disconnects among reps on the, in the same team or across territories or people who have different roles at different parts of the selling cycle in the process. So a number of selling organizations and teams and companies will adopt an approach they call a playbook most commonly, but they, you may call it a guide. I had a client call it a recipe book, basically saying, hey, what if I had some uh, dinner guests coming in at the last minute? What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to see what's in the freezer, what's in the spice rack, what's in the refrigerator, find out if there are any food allergies or sensitivities, what people want, and I'll take what I have and I will tailor that meal, in this case, it would be that conversation to particular priority conversations that we need to have. So what I'm going to talk about in my track is playbooks, basically some organizing framework for you to align your message with the things that you have to offer, where you stand out, and importantly, what prospects want and need and how you can be relevant and clear and consistent in those customer conversations all along the track. So we'll talk a little bit about what a playbook is and is not, what problems you can solve and cannot solve with a playbook. And then if you decide to go for that approach as a team, what goes in it, how to build it, and, and how to use it. But uh, overall, the, the point is about, again, messaging. Uh, Daryl, one of the things that, that I've found in, uh, in the course of, of working on, on these kinds of projects and doing advisory work and speaking is that there's such a big opportunity here. It is, it's common that really good reps offering high value services are far more confident in the value of what they sell than in how to talk about it. And that's criminal. It, it takes away your commissions, your livelihood, your reputation. It takes away even the way that you think about yourself and what you do. There's no reason that we can't be as confident in how to talk about what we sell as in what we sell. And uh, so we'll be talking about some ways uh, in Outbound to be able to do that for yourself and across the team. That's outboundconference.com. Check Jim Carr out there. In the meantime, please 
work on your messaging. Don't do what Daryl does. That's just stupid. Speaking of Daryl, he's out of here as he talks about himself in the third person. But he hopes you had a fantastic time. Thank you so much, Jim. And for you folks, I'll see you back here again next week. Take care. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.